Should I get started? Hello, hello. Should I get started, Snow? Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess we don't have a, a residence case today, so I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Mark Newfer. I'm one of the Cornea Fellows that's been here, and um, I hope you get the humor in my title there. If you say DSEC real, real fast, it sounds like um, the heck, what DSEC, what the heck, why isn't my vision 2020? So I just want to talk about that a little bit. <coughs> oh, it's my financial disclosure is that I, I'm owned and financed by the Air Force. <laughs> and uh, nothing I say will actually uh, represent anything to the, of the government. <coughs> my first presentation when I was in the military, I went to Arvo. And when I got back, I got an email from someone I don't know who said, your presentation was good, but you forgot to include this paragraph. Make sure you include this paragraph in every presentation you give from now on. So there it is, in, ca in case Big Brother's watching. So just to update some of you um, on, on the DSEC, and this is for those retina people who probably aren't here. So the DSEC is we, we uh, take out Decimase membrane, and then we put the graft inside and it, it approximates the host. So that's the DSEC. And this is some a picture of a patient that had a DSEC. And, and you can look at that cornea. It looks really nice and clear. And if you look at that and then look at the lens and the retina, and if the lens and the retina are fine, you think, well, that, that patient, patient's best corrected visual acuity should be 20-20, because that's a nice, clear cornea. Uh, this is what I thought at the beginning of fellowship. and I was going up to uh, Boise to do a clinic up there with a former resident here. His name's Jim Tweeten. And we were seeing a, a handful of DSEC patients, and they looked like this. And we both thought, that why aren't they seeing 2020? Because these patients were seeing about 2050, 2070. And Dr. Tweeten had just bought a, an OCT, so we were getting OCTs on all these patients to look at their macula, and, and all the maculas were normal. And we were really scratching our heads wondering, why these patients with this nice clear cornea and, and their good lens and a good retina, why they weren't seeing 2020 with, with glasses on. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about that. And um, I'm going to present a case uh, of one of our patients. But like I said, there uh, during this past year, I've seen about six patients like this, the patients that have had great DSEC visits and just can't quite make it to 2020. So just to start off, this is a 64-year-old male who was referred here for freak corneal dystrophy, more in the left eye than in the right eye. Um, he said that his vision had been gradually getting worse over the last few months. On uh, his past medical history, he had some atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and medications to treat those appropriately. He didn't really have any past ocular history other than the freak corneal dystrophy and cataract, wasn't taking any medications, and hadn't had any surgeries. So here's his eye examination. He was, his best corrected visual acuity was 2030 in the right and 2060 in the left. The slit lamp examination was notable for uh, guttata on the right and then more guttata on the left with a little bit of uh, cornea scarring. He also had significant cataracts. The fundoscopic examination was normal with no problems of the macula. So he underwent an eventful, uneventful phaco desect of the left eye. So he recovered uh, appropriately. Three months out, his best corrected visual acuity was only 2070. On examination, it looked like the DSEC graft was nice and clear, just a little bit of that scar, uh, central scar in remaining. And then he had a significant PCO. So he received a rad capsulotomy to improve his vision. At six months, he was not happy. His best corrected visual acuity was still only 2040. On slit lamp examination, uh, his DSEC graft looked clear again. It looks great. We told him, hey, that, that was a great transplant. A little bit of that central scar, but really not significant. His lens looked good. We performed an OCT, and there, there was no macular edema, no epiretinal membrane. By the way, this isn't the patient, so that's not a HIPAA violation. That's actually my father-in-law. That, <laughs> that, that's the picture I took after I asked him if I could marry his daughter. <laughs> So here's, here's our patient. This is, here's his corneas. And once again, you can just see a really nice 
good clear cornea, a good clear graft. And then if you look, there was a little bit of the, the central scarring, but very faint, a very faint haze. Wouldn't be affecting his vision, definitely not to a 2040. So I want to, you know, I'll, I'll incorporate some of his exam findings as I talk about this. I want to talk about why patients that have had DSEC aren't achieving 2020. And I think this is important because you'll see more and more DSEC patients in your clinic because this is the standard of care for fixed corneal dystrophy. And it's important to think about, you know, why they're not achieving the 2020 vision. There's four reasons that I found um, from discussion with uh, Dr. Mosbar, Dr. Mifflin, and doing the literature search. One is the interface haze. The other one's high order aberrations of the posterior cornea. Another one is the prismatic effect of the donor tissue that Lloyd talked about a couple months ago. And then the last one is an irregular anterior corneal astigmatism. So I'll talk about those. So there's been a couple articles where they've done confocal microscopy on these patients, and they found that at the interface there's been this haze with these highly reflective particles. And they feel that this could be affecting vision. This is something we don't see in the slit lamp exam, but confocal microscopy shows it. Uh, the, this um, author followed these patients over six months and found that the haze um, improved but persisted over six months. I thought that was interesting because usually at a month out of the DSEC, their corneal graft is looking very clear, the cornea looks clear, um, but it's interesting that their vision doesn't improve for months later, and it could be partly because of the interface haze. The highly reflective particles are thought to be possibly from the microkeratome, some shavings from that, meibomian gland secretion, just any kind of debris that gets on the stromal tissue as we insert it into the eye. A group from UT Southwestern wanted to look at the higher order aberrations of the, um, in uh, DSEC patients using the Pentacam. And they took uh, control eyes, PKP eyes, and DSEC eyes and <coughs> performed the Pentacam on them and, compar and compared them. And what they found is that there was a significant difference between the PKP and control eyes, um, high order aberrations of the posterior cornea compared with the DSEC eyes and their high order aberrations of the posterior cornea at the six millimeter optical zone. And here's a picture that will show that. So you can see here, um, here's the anterior surface looking at the high order aberrations. And what they found is that for the DSEC patients, there wasn't much of a difference. And, and C and D are just two different DSEC patients. There's nothing significant other than they're just two different ones. So there's not much difference between the anterior high order aberrations except as you would expect with the PKP, uh, there was a difference in the anterior high order aberration from the control. Looking at the posterior, they found, they found that there wasn't difference between the posterior, between the normal and the PKP on the posterior. But you can appreciate with the DSEC patients, there's a significant difference in high order aberration. And, uh, and we feel that this could be contributing to, uh, to some of the decreased vision. So something that, that uh, Lloyd mentioned a couple weeks ago in, in detail that probably applies to our patient too is that um, there's you can have a prismatic effect of the donor tissue as it's on the, the back of the cornea. This kind of starts at the microkeratome and the tissue punch. Sometimes you can get an eccentric cut. And so instead of being this nice oval shape or, or a circular shape, you can get an oval shape. We feel that this can kind of can lead to a prismatic effect as it lays on the back of the, tier of the back of the cornea and isn't even. You can appreciate here from this paper by Huck Holtz that over here, the corneal thickness was 212 microns and it was greater than 100 microns different on the other side. Uh, there's in this paper, he talked about the hyperopic shift because of the posterior curvature of the DSEC. And if you think about this hyperopic shift that you get from the posterior curvature and then the, the change in the diopters as you go from one side to the other, you can definitely get a prismatic effect. Kind of goes back to Prentice's rule where the farther out you are from the, the optic zone per diopter, you get a more prismatic effect. And the same thing could be happening with our DSEC patients. So let's look at our, our patient. Uh, this is the his OCT, and it looks pretty good. Looks pretty even, not perfectly even. Let's look at his pentacam. Now this is his right eye, 
And this was the eye that didn't receive surgery. And you can appreciate the PEM scan. It shows a, a thickened cornea, as you would expect with someone with Fuchs. And then you can look at the posterior slopes here, and it looks pretty symmetrical. So let's look at his eye that had the defect surgery. So very abnormal. Now very interesting how this uh, says that near the optical center it's thinner, and then it gets very thick going out. And that's kind of what we were seeing with Huck Holtz's picture back here, this thickening. And then look at how different the elevation is. You have it, it's in the positive range here, negative range there. So this uh, discrepancy between the sides, or the unevenness or asymmetry, could be causing this prismatic effect in these defect patients. And we're going to think about Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not from the same defect. That's from our patient. It was from a different. Okay, and then here's another uh, topic that I want to talk about that I've been researching recently, irregular astigmatism. And just to kind of give a little background, way back in 1898, they started a scissional keratotomy, and this was popularized more by a, a Russian friend with RK. And he found that um, as he made these corneal incisions, they were flattening in the incisional meridian and sweeping you 90 degrees away. Back in 2006, Price and Price published an article where they described this new technique called denting incisions. Uh, during this time, it was hard to keep the DSEC graft attached to the host, and they found that if they put these full thickness incisions, three to four of them, mid-peripherally, um, that they could have the aqueous fluid between the interface egress through these incisions, and that would help the donor tissue approximate to the host tissue better. So here's a picture of a patient after surgery, and you can appreciate the denting incisions here, here, and here. So just small 15 degree grade incisions. Now here's his photography, and the question is, can you see the venting incisions? Now to help highlight that, so there's the venting incisions. So you can see that they have that effect of flattening and steepening, and as a result, kind of create this irregular corneal astigmatism. So here's a patient, and, and the question is, how long does that last? Here's a patient one year out. You can still appreciate where the venting incisions were, these flattened areas here. Okay, here's the same patient. Two years out, you can still see the venting incisions areas. And now four years out, still this kind of irregular astigmatism from the venting incisions. Now, so what I did was uh, took a cadaver eye, did the topography, and then performed immediately afterwards four venting incisions at the six millimeter zone. And you can appreciate that once again, you get this irregular astigmatism from these venting incisions. So before and after. So that's also could be contributing to these patients' uh, inability to achieve a 2020 with spectacles. So just in conclusion, here are some of the reasons that I found that the patients aren't achieving 2020, even though they have good, clear corneas, good macros, and uh, and a good lens. And it's from the interface haze, high order aberrations of posterior cornea, prismatic effect of the donor tissue, and irregular corneal astigmatism from the venting incisions. Any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, and that's a good point. Maybe we should measure it and be more precise on how far apart they are and how symmetrical, and maybe that would improve it.
Yeah, on the, the patient I presented, we did do a hard contact lens um, refraction on him, and he still was only able to see 2040. You know, but a, as I was showing, I was wonder I wonder if it's more of that asymmetry in the posterior curvature of the cornea for him. But yeah, he, he was still only able to see the 2040 vision. Dr. Shaw. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, this is my last slide. Those are my corneas. That's a good treatment. Can I anyone guess what my K's were or my uh, prescription was before the PRK treatment from that? I was about a 45 average K and a, and a minus 8. So good treatment. Um, okay. Well, thank you.